I've spent a lot of time contemplating my game of the year for 2020. Now, it was a little rough, and I went through several rewrites, re-recordings of the idea, because I'm trying to balance it so that I don't pick literally just remasters and remakes, because my 2020 was mostly defined by re-releases of games that I had already played. If you want to know what my real list would look like, it would look like this. Now, minus the last one, because that would be one of the games you're going to see here, I think 2020 was really an interesting year, because we got a lot of heavy-hitting games, and then we got a lot of remakes, remasters, and the such. Now, some of these have to do with the re-release of games with new content, new platforms, or because the next-gen systems are coming out. And unfortunately, for all the new games that came out this year, pretty much more than half of these happen to be in my top five favorite games of all time. So, yeah, a little, a little rough. It's a little rough for for um, 2020's games. Now, considering everything that came out this year, you know, I played Persona 5R like 10 times. It's three, really, but yeah, and I did did a lot of did a lot of Persona dancing. Um, probably never going back to that ever again. They're okay, but I'm not good at rhythm games. Um, yeah, but. This year, played a lot of stuff. A lot of open world games, had a lot of heavy criticisms for open world games. You know, watched a lot of new weird games with mechs, decided that I don't like a lot of mech designs, never got around to finishing a bunch of games, and yeah, I've, I've, done, I've done a lot, you know. But, well, I guess we'll get started. So, since we're removing remasters, the first game on the list is, of course, Animal Crossing New Horizons at number 5. Animal Crossing is not at all a complex or difficult game. It was, in fact, something really easy. I wouldn't call it one of the greatest games of the year, and certainly not, as you can see, it would sit technically at number 9, but it's a good game. It's lighthearted, it's fun, and it's not something you play for hours and hours on end. I mean, unless you're really into it, but even then, playing it for hours and hours is hard to do when there's not that much to do in the game. Now, Animal Crossing New Horizons is not as good as New Leaf. Though I haven't played New Leaf, I have seen what New Leaf has, and New Horizons does not live up to that expectation as of yet. We'll have to see in the coming years if it improves, but my expectations are low, and I'm unsure if I'm ever going to pick it up and put it back down, because my current status of playing Animal Crossing has been zero for about four to five months, so yeah. Good game. Came out at a good time, just not as good as the previous entries. Now, sitting at number four, we have Ghost of Tsushima. Ghost of Tsushima is, I guess, Sony's breaking hit title for the year for most people. Um, I honestly don't think it was anything, it does anything special. It's hard to describe. I liked the game, I enjoyed it. Does it do anything groundbreaking and amazing? Absolutely not. The visuals are really good. The gameplay is fun, and the content is mostly serviceable. It basically does what Assassin's Creed and Ubisoft have failed to do so far, where it trims the fat off of the franchise. If this was an Assassin's Creed game, you'd start the game, You'd play as young Jin for like 
an hour to 30 minutes. You'd have this weird prologue that kind of throws you in at a random time. And then you'd basically go to some random place and stumble upon the tools to become an assassin. And some of that kind of happens in Ghost of Tsushima, where you have this prologue that kind of just tosses you into the game. But you don't, you're not forced to play as young Jin for more than like, maybe five minutes, you know? And that honestly pushes the game further a lot more because I don't really care about playing as young protagonist X, you know? It's just not a part of the experience I want to deal with. I want to start the game, get into the action, and just keep going. Ghost of Tsushima does that, and it does that through its entire gameplay. The start, like most Assassin's Creed games, is still a little bit of a build-up, but that build-up happens a lot faster, and you're introduced to a lot more interesting characters right off the bat. Now, it still follows the same Ubisoft formulas, and ultimately, I would not call it a good open world game, I'd call it an average open world game. The narrative and the side missions kind of drive it forward, though I wouldn't say that I was completely interested in the narrative until nearly the halfway through the second act or even into the third act. I just was not super captured by any of the side missions or the narrative. But ultimately it's a lot of fun, and they give you a lot of tools to have that fun if you're willing to not approach every mission the exact same way. For me, I kind of just kicked around enemies instead of actually killing them because I found that more interesting. And I also set the stealth level to zero because I'm lazy and I don't like stealth segments. But I would call it a good aspect of gameplay and accessibility if you actually have something that dials down the sensitivity of stealth missions and such. Hyrule Warriors Age of Calamity. Now, Age of Calamity is a Warriors game, and people tend to not like Warriors games. According to every subreddit that's gotten a Warriors spinoff in existence, Warriors games are boring, repetitive, and pointless because all you do is mow down mobs, and that's it. And I want to take this time to address Warriors games are not actually just mowing down mobs. There's a sense of map control and really just a slightly more difficult system than you're imagining. There are, I have failed missions in Warriors games tons of times. While Age of Calamity I did not because I've gotten better at these games and managing the map is much easier, I do believe that the misconception of Warriors is that it is 100% a power fantasy. Because it kind of is a power fantasy, a good maybe 60 to 70% of the time, but sometimes you're just going to get wailed on by bosses and stronger enemies if you're not careful or if you're not the right level. So you can really approach this game however you want. Age of Calamity essentially makes warriors feel like Breath of the Wild which is not what I was expecting the game to be like. Now there are some things in the story that I have my gripes with, of course, but I'm not really on the fence about the fact that I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the game from start to finish, and I liked how the cast of characters was a variety, unlike some Warriors games that I know, and it felt like a polished title. The only problem I ran into was maybe performance. And yes, the performance is not the best. You are going to have some times where frame rates are sub 30. And that will bother some people. So be careful when you look at a game like that. And in two player, I've seen some footage, have not played it, do not want to play it. The game does not run super well in multiplayer. but. I think overall, Age of Calamity is a great game, and if you liked Breath of the Wild, you'll probably find something to enjoy in Age of Calamity, as I did. 
it sits at number 3 on this list, but really, number 7 on my actual list. It has its faults, but I think there is something to like in these Warriors spin-offs that keep happening, and are going to keep happening, and there's one coming out soon, at least in the West, unlike Japan who got it a year before, but I'm excited for that as well. Number two is Genshin Impact. Probably not that surprising. I love this game. For all of the faults that it has and the fact that it is a gacha game, I really enjoy my time playing this game, which I still do play to this day. It's really a weird experience because people will tell me that doing a lot of the things in this game feels like chores and work, but... I honestly just don't feel that way. And I do agree, there is a point where gacha games feel like you're just grinding for, you know, your next role instead of actually playing the game, but I've enjoyed the gameplay loop in Genshin so much that I just haven't felt that way yet. And if you feel that way, that's okay. I hope this game continues to grow, because there's a lot of things that need to be changed. Um, Please just, you know, change the adventure handbook functioning, like, make the targeting move to the next enemies, that'd be really nice. It's really annoying to deal with right now. But, yeah, I really enjoy this game. And I hope that whatever content is coming out next, whatever comes in the future, will be just as high quality as the other stuff that's been coming out. I don't know when we'll get actual story continuation, but I'm okay with them doling out character quests and then only doing story quests on occasion. That makes it seem like I don't have to play the game for super long all the time, you know? It's, it gives me a break from the game, which allows me to come back fresher even if I've been playing it consistently for an hour every day. And my favorite original game of the year is... Spider-Man Miles Morales. Now, this game is an open world game done right. It is done right to the best way it can be done. The traversal is fun, it's energetic, it's easy to do, and it's creative. That's all you need, all right? The traversal method just has to be interesting, fast, fluid, and you've got yourself a good open world game. The point of an open world to me is to have a huge world that builds a sense of scale, but also to show that you can traverse that world fairly easily. The problem with games that don't focus on this is that they become fast travel bots. You wind up wanting to fast travel to every location instead of going and walking or running everywhere because it's fucking annoying. Miles Morales did not have me use the fast travel a single time outside of the tutorial, and it was great. Aside from a few loading problems because of older hardware, Miles Morales just really does everything the previous Spider-Man game did, but better. The combat's flashier, there might be less gadgets, but with the additions to the combat, I didn't really mind it that much. I think they're actually going to have to work pretty hard to make Peter a interesting combat-based Spider-Man now, since Miles has the Venom powers and such. I think that they did a really good job with the story, and while I didn't have the same feeling I did with the conclusion of the story, where it's Doc Ock versus Peter instead of Miles versus um, Finn, I still enjoyed it. I still thought it was good, just the ending wasn't as climactic as, or as emotional as the original game. But that's okay. I think with this being a shorter game, and really the first adventure for Miles that's solely Miles focused, which is great by the way, didn't have to play as Mary Jane, didn't have to play as any character other than Miles. And that's exactly how I want the games to be. Focus on Spider-Man, not the other characters. 
it winds up being a fun experience in a pretty well designed open world due to the traversal mechanics of the game. I completed pretty much everything in this game from start to finish and I would really enjoy whatever's coming next. But that's my top game of 2020 out of the original games. So those were my top five games of 2020. And yes, I did purposefully push out Persona 5 because I'm never going to get around to not loving that game. But you know, it's, it is what it is. I think 2020 has had a phenomenal list of games this year and some not so great ones that I didn't play because I wasn't interested in them. Now, there are a few games that I would like to give kind of honorable mentions to. Um, the first one being Watch Dogs Legion. I didn't care much for Legion's story. It was decent, but I feel like they were a little non-committal with the ending. Um, the reason why Legion isn't on this list is because, one, the multiplayer is not out, which is, for me, part of, like, the main thing for Watch Dogs, and two, it was just an average game. Like, it's weird to put it on an honorable mentions list when I felt like it was just average, but I put Animal Crossing on here, and I put Ghost of Tsushima on here. I had fun with Legion. There was a lot to love. I feel like had they prioritized development on next-gen consoles, the game could have been a lot better because there are so many things on older hardware that will hold the game back from what it wants to be. Now, of course, people didn't really like Legion. I can understand that. It's a generic Ubisoft title, no matter what you say. But I had fun with it, so I would put it on an honorable mentions list. Now, there are also a few games I didn't manage to finish this year, one of which being 13 Sentinels. And I'd love to, you know, finish it soon. Um, there have just been some hitches with my motivation to play the game, but I'll definitely go back to it and finish it up when the time comes. I think so far it's a phenomenal game with great visuals, and... Unfortunately, I just haven't had the time or motivation to finish it, but we'll get there eventually. That's really about it for my top five games of 2020. Thank you for watching, and I hope to see you in the next video.